Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, the title of the webinar is Advanced Features of Peregrine. I'm Matthew Gilbert and I'm joined today by Lin Wei He, my colleague from the University of Sheffield. In terms of the, the running order, um, we're going to look at um, a number of different areas of, of interest. So extended layout optimization methods, advanced Peregrine features and we're also going to preview some forthcoming features in the next version of um, the, the, the Peregrine plugin. If you've got any questions during the course of the event, um, please use the question box in GoToWebinar and we'll pick them up at the end. Webinar today is brought to you by iCare, the Integrated Civil and Infrastructure Research Centre. I picked out a couple of um, parts from the vision and mission statement that are relevant to today's uh, topic. So resource efficiency and the introduction of technologies capable of delivering step change in the design um, of physical infrastructure. Um, hopefully, um, those of you who are joining us today are aware of Peregrine. Um, so um, this is um, looking at intermediate or advanced uh, areas of usage, but uh, if you've if you're not clear about what it is, uh, it's a layout optimization plugin for, for the Rhino and Grasshopper environments. It allows rapid identification of structurally efficient uh, concepts. Um, developed during um, a couple of projects, one UK government funded project um, where you can find more information on from the, uh, the BuildOpt website shown on screen, buildopt.org. The current version is a sort of follow on um, project where we have been working with Arup and Limit State um, to develop a version um, which is um, publicly accessible. And the, the software is now maintained and developed by Limit State and you can download a copy uh, by following the link shown on screen at Food for Rhino. So in terms of um, forthcoming um, events, we have um, hands-on workshop this time next week. Um, so this is going to be a slightly different format to the webinars that we've been holding. Um, we will use a collaborative environment to allow um, both us to deliver some present some material as we are now, but also uh, breakout rooms where you'll be able to um, get hopefully one-to-one -one assistance. So the first one is a sort of introductory one, that's next week, and then in early September, we will have an advanced usage uh, workshop where there will be an opportunity to hopefully try some of the new features that we'll be, uh, be, be outlining uh, during this particular webinar. If you want to register, then join. Um, uh, sorry, registration links are accessible via buildup.org um, if you follow that link. Okay, so done a bit of housekeeping now, let's move on now to look at the um, um, some of the the methods that we might want to um, um, apply if we are going to apply layout optimization in, in practice. So extended layout optimization methods. If we start off by thinking about um, what we get from a basic layout optimization formulation and and what drawbacks the solutions have, and I think that's a, a useful place to start. The key thing is that a, a, a basic layout optimization is likely to give rise to impractical solutions. And we've got uh, a solution shown on screen here, um, actually derived using the, the layout web app, which is publicly accessible. And you can see a variety of, of issues. Um, one is that we have lots of elements and joints which would be difficult if not possible to fabricate depending on the on the process we might have some slender or thin elements that are prone to buckling and compression um, in this particular case we've also got an element which is in unstable equilibrium this is a pin jointed truss so clearly um, that um, blue element near the top of the uh, the screen um, is potentially um, liable to, 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 to fall over. Interestingly, we've got a, another element, a twin at the bottom, um, where 
we have a scenario where it's stable equilibrium because that member is in tension. And one thing to, to point out, I guess, before we go any further, is that the outputs from any optimization are largely a function of the input. So we haven't said in the definition of this problem anything about um, the propensity for a, a membering compression to buckle. We haven't said um, anything about the differences between, for example, the blue bar at the top and the, the red bar at the top. As far as the algorithm is concerned, it's looking for equilibrium. It doesn't know the difference between stable equilibrium and unstable equilibrium. And that's something that you need to bear in mind whenever you're using optimization. You need to make sure that the inputs are sufficient to properly prescribe your problem. Now, how do we how do we do that? How do we extend the formulation so we can actually um, add in some practical scenarios? And the practical scenarios could be to do with ensuring that the solutions are simple, or it could be to ensure that they, for example, are are stable against um, buckling instability. Well, in the community, for for many years, there's been a, a focus on um, the first of the of the methods I, 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 you can see on screen. So using meta heuristic methods such as genetic algorithms. Um, what you can do with these methods is you can add a huge amount of complexity to the problem formulation. Uh, so it's really useful um, in that respect. However, the downside is that you are very likely to obtain only a locally optimal solution. So if, for example, you're minimizing the volume, you're going to be um, some distance away. So it's going to have a, a larger volume, a higher volume than the globally optimal solution. You don't actually know how much higher you're going to be, which is a, a major drawback. And in many cases, because of computational expense, um, that gap is often going to be quite large. So in the work that we have been undertaking um, as part of the build-up project, and, and certainly what we're going to be describing today, is an alternative two-step approach, um, sometimes called a global-local approach. And what we do is, first of all, solve a, a linear relaxation. So we get to the bottom of this valley. We've relaxed some of the constraints, so we don't have all the complexity that we would see in the real world. But then we move from that globally optimal relaxed solution to a nearby local optimal using a second step. So that's the approach that we um, have been um, using. The first step, how do we get that globally optimal initial solution, we use numerical layout optimization using a method that's been around for, for more than um, 50 years. Um, and big benefit of that is that we can get a solution really quickly. Um, and also, as I've just intimated, the solution acts as a very useful benchmark against which other solutions can, can be judged. So the gap between this solution and any other solutions is going to be measurable from now on. In terms of the mathematics, um, it says advanced in the, in, in the title of the webinar, so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling able to, 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 to show an equation or two. Um, it's actually really simple. We're minimizing the volume of material in the truss in the, in the basic formulation. And what is volume? It's the sum of the lengths times the areas of all the, the members in the in the truss. The, con the main constraint here is an equilibrium constraint. We're basically looking for equilibrium between the applied nodal forces and the internal forces in the, in the members or bars. And then finally, we have um, stress constraints um, that you can see. Um, on screen and also finally a non-negativity constraint so the area has got to be positive so the variables in this problem formulation are the internal bar forces and the cross-sectional areas 
if we have multiple load cases, um, and I was asked about this in the in the, the webinar last week, then it's a really small change to this formulation. All we now have is instead of a series of internal bar forces um, that are unique, we actually have for every load case for a physical bar, you have two possible um, forces. One for um, load case one, and the other for load case two, if you've got two load cases. And similarly, the external forces, clearly load case one, we might have a given force at a particular nerd. Low case two, we might have a, a, another force. So formulation is really simple, even if we have multiple low cases. However, it's worth bearing in mind, this formulation assumes effectively that the behavior of the um, the members is, uh, is plastic, so that you can have ductile yielding um, of the uh, material. Um, so it's not suitable if you are wanting to optimize, um, for example, a brittle a structure form from a brittle material. If you want more information about the formulation, then there's a, a reference shown on screen at the bottom. So first of all, we find this these um, linear um, solutions using uh, linear programming. So use optimization. We um, then want to move to a more practically useful solution. So step two, where we are going to rationalize the solution using jump translation. And we talked about this last time. So we move or merge the, the, the joints to improve the solution. We can then, if we want, simplify the solution either manually or automatically. For example, reducing the number of members or joints. And we've got a couple of examples here. This is using the same problems we looked at a couple of slides ago. Initially, we've rationalized the solution. So it certainly looks um, simpler than it did before, but, but still possibly not simple enough. So we, um, we can simplify it um, depending on what trade-off we're happy with in terms of the increase in volume. And again, these two solutions were, were obtained using the, the web app available at layopt.com. However, you can see that some of the intrinsic problems in the solution haven't been tackled. We've still got this upper blue element in unstable equilibrium. So we might want to um, use an enriched formulation to take account of global stability and also local stability, which we haven't yet dealt with. And another thing that we might be interested in is actually looking at a more holistic formulation where we're not just in, interested in trusses, but we're also interested in, in beam elements as well. And these two latter um, areas are, are things that we've been focusing on in the, in the upcoming um, Peregrine release. So just very, very briefly, just revisit the equations. So if we've got local buckling, then we end up with a nonlinear constraint. We don't simply have a nice simple stress constraint where we've got a fixed value of limiting stress in tension and compression. We've got this, this nonlinear constraint. For global stability, um, we also have um, a linear buckling constraint and uh, a desired um, stability load factor and um, a couple of references there that point you to um, papers which cover those um, th those areas but Limway will demonstrate um, some of the outcomes from implementing these formulations in his slides a little bit later on in today's webinar and then the last thing that I'm going to just briefly introduced before I hand over to Limway is um, a slide on uh, talk, 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 talk you through um, grillage level optimization. So the trust level optimization we've, we've, we've looked at um, in, in the last few slides. Potentially we can use almost exactly the same mathematical formulation to optimize grillages. And so these could be floor plates in a building where now 
we are actually identifying where the best place to put beams is. So instead of truss bars, these are beams. Using grillage formulation, you know what your um, allowable depth is, and you simply adjust the widths of the beam in order to find the, the minimum volume solution. And potentially, we can combine um, the truss optimization and the grid optimization to um, provide a holistic building design. And Linware will, will give you a little example or two of, of how that can be um, achieved. And just to give you a, a, a flavor of how important grillage layout is, um, this is a plan view of a very, very simple um, floor plate where we've got distributed loading. And what we've allowed in this case is for the column positions to be optimized as well as the, the grillage positions and the grillage uh, beam widths. And you can see that the optimized um, layout on the left is more than five or a, less than a fifth the volume of the more conventional um, floor, floor um, layout on the right. So the difference is on the right, we've got columns at the corners, which is very common. And then we've got uniform width of the, um, the various beam elements. So it gives you a flavor of, of how much scope there is to reduce the, the volume using this, uh, this technique. Okay, I'm just gonna um, hand over now to, uh, um, to Limway, who's going to, um, move on to actually using Peregrine and, and, and demonstrating some of the, um, um, the features that you can gain access to initially in the current version, but, but subsequently in um, the forthcoming release. Right. Hello, everyone. I'm Ling Wei. So today I will be, uh, first I will be talking about some of the um, advanced usage of Peregrine by looking at some of the, uh, the common issues. This will include how we can simplify our design and how we can generate symmetrical structures, and also some uh, my personal experience about how we can perform very really efficient parametric studies, and also some discussions about how we can discretize the uh, pressure mode. So first, look, let's look at the uh, simplification. So in program, we do provide a wide range of tools to simplify the design. So last week we introduced we got two optimization tools, including the uh, rationalization and the simplification to generate simplified designs. However, in some cases we do want a bit more control and more manual control. So we actually have um, one of the four components. Uh, Martin, next. Uh, oops. Yeah, we got another four components. This will include the, uh, the filter, merge, enclosure, and complexity components. They will actually uh, provide some manual intervention tools for us to further simplify the, uh, the structures with a bit more control by ourselves. So all of the uh, the designs of uh, the, uh, the components are very similar. So instead of uh, solving an optimization problem, in these uh, components, we directly remove structural elements. So as a result, as you might know that, our uh, structure might no longer be valid, trust structures and the equilibrium condition at the joints might not be satisfied. So we might need to convert all the, uh, some of the trust members to beams to satisfy the equilibrium condition at joints. And we know the beams are less efficient than trusses. So we normally use the um, geometry optimization to minimize the bending moment. And in many cases, the bending elements will then be converted back to truss elements. So the structural efficiency is again increased. So here I would like to show a very, very simple example to see how we can use the tools. Assume we have this problem and we would like to filter some of the uh, tiny elements there. So if we select the element and uh, change the control of the element in this case, it will be the filter threshold. You can actually preview all the small members. And then if you enable, the component, it will directly remove all the members, and then the uh, rationalization tool will rationalize it and remove all the bandwidth. And you can see the um, outcome structure becomes simplified again. So next, I would be uh, talking about the uh, symmetrical designs. 
And instead of uh, talking about how we solve the problem, I, I do want to explain why our optimization methods do not always generate a symmetrical structure. So here I show a very simple linear optimization problem. And in many cases, the uh, optimal value is a line instead of a point. That means any point on this line is equally optimal. Assume we have one point in the this is a symmetrical design. However, our optimization algorithm does not know that. We will hit any point on this line and will converge. So it is quite challenging for the optimization to find a symmetrical design. And if the problem becomes more complex, for example, if we are solving a non-complex, non-linear optimization problem, and it becomes more obvious. So sometimes the uh, symmetrical design is not optimal. So the optimization algorithm will push the node either towards the left or to the right. However, either way, it will not create a symmetrical structure. So that are the, um, those are the uh, problems why we can't always guarantee a symmetrical design. So how can we generate symmetrical designs? So here I provide two tips. So one is to use directional support to create some symmetrical conditions for your design. Then you can basically mirror it in Grasshopper and you have a symmetrical design. So for the uh, 2D designs, you can use directional supports. And for 3D designs, you can actually add a normal, plan, normal support to the plane. So you can create a, a nice symmetrical design problem. And another tip is to use a symmetrical nodal grid. So if, if the nodes are not symmetrical, then we're not very likely to get a symmetrical solution. So in that case, normally we need to provide a symmetrical nodal grid. In case that the auto-generated nodes are not symmetrical, we can actually create our own nodal grids and supply those nodes to the solver via the user nodes input. So these two options might help us to generate symmetrical designs. So next, I would like to share some of my experience how we can perform very rapid parametric study using program. So right now, and Grasshopper provides a fantastic like, tool for us to perform parametric studies. So here, I would like to uh, take advantage of the tree structure in Grasshopper to perform a parametric study. So here, the first example, we would like to generate solutions by varying the nodal density. And here you can see the workflow is quite simple, and we can very rapidly generate lots of solutions on the right. So I will explain the workflow, workflow in more details. So first, you need to create a range of values, which in this case will be the uh, different nodal density we would like to investigate. And then in the, uh, in the, in the design domain, we need to um, graph the, the, uh, the values into the uh, nodal division input, which actually we will create a tree structure in Grasshopper. So the tree will contain many leaves, and each data leaf is a single case, and they will be processed by Peregrine separately. That means Peregrine will run these problems separately, then we'll generate lots of solutions. Then before the uh, solution viewer, we need to flatten the tree, then we collect all the solutions in the list, then they will be processed by the solution viewer component. And of course, it will be quite handy for us to set some weight values to the uh, structural efficiency and the complexity, so we can sort the structures in the gallery. So this has many other usage. So here I'm showing a different example. So we can we can actually do the parametric study of, by varying the uh, load of locations and, and see how it affects the, the design. And here again, it's really, really a very similar like uh, idea. We have all the, um, the loaded points and we graphed all the points and it will create, in this case, five independent optimization problems for Peregrine. And it will basically process these and generate the gallery. However, we can do this in a slightly different way. And uh, for example, if after we created all the low cases and we can actually flatten the tree and this will actually collect all the low cases and they will be supplied as a multiple low case problem. So then we can have a very easy way to create problems with different low cases. So that, that those examples actually are quite simple. It just shows how we can take advantage of some like the grasshopper data structures to create some very fascinating uh, design problems very easily. So next um, is some discussions about how we can create, uh, or how we can uh, discretize the UDL loading. So in Paragon, the UDL is discretized as point nodes. So unfortunately, at the moment, the number of nodal divisions is not optimized. So users have to uh, input the number of nodal divisions. 
Although this is an ongoing research, at the moment we do have some alternative solution. So if we take advantage of the global and local optimization framework, we can actually try different node divisions in layout optimization, and then we can compile the results. So here I'm showing a very simple example. So we have a structure under UDL load. As we know the more node divisions we have in UDL, we get better solutions. And first, we need to do a parametric study of UDL discretization. So here I put four potential uh, nodal divisions for the UDL. And um, because we are actually comparing the benchmark solution, so we need to use a relatively fine nodal grid. And then because we use a very fine nodal grid, you, you might imagine that we get very, very massive structures. However, that's not really, really uh, what we, uh, we use this for. And so we don't need to actually care about the practicality of the design, and we only need to solve the layout transition to, to study the impacts of different nodal divisions. So here you can see if I use five UDL divisions, I got the structure which is only 1.6% heavier than the other one, the, uh, the other one with 30 nodal divisions, which means the um, UDL division in this case might not be significant. So we can actually uh, use um, a proper like, node division here. I'm using like five node divisions, and then I can simplify the design and get a quite simple design. And also the low pass is quite clear in this case. So that is how we can um, decide how many other node divisions we use for UDL in the current version of the Paragon. So, um, so that's all the, um, the, 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 the tips or, or some advanced usage and to solve some of the uh, existing issues we found uh, over the years. So next, I will basically spend some time explaining the, uh, some of the uh, forthcoming features in Paragon. This will include the local and global stability and grillage optimization and also the holistic building design optimization. So first, for local stability, we actually refer to polar buckling. So if the optimization problem is considered without polar buckling, we know we have a very nice convex optimization problem, and we have a global optimal solution readily to be found using layout optimization. However, if we in include it polar buckling, then the problem becomes quite challenging to solve. And you, you can notice that um, there are several local optimal points which are very challenging. So in the current version of Paragon, we do have an uh, approach to solve the uh, all buckling, which is basically we keep the layout and we scale all the members. However, we found that we only find one local optimal and this is not necessarily the best one. And in some cases, the gap to the global optimal is quite large. So this is not satisfactory. So in our new version, we actually put a new algorithm which will explored more local optimums in the design space, and we will actually increase the likelihood we can find better solutions. So this is, uh, of course, a heuristic approach. So there's no guarantee that we will always get the best solution. However, we do know the gap to the relaxed global optimal. So, so in cases we get a solution, and if the gap is not very large, then we can accept the solution and proceed with other the tools. And of course, this, uh, this tool is designed for generating uh, practical solutions. And so it's not ideal to generate uh, benchmark solutions using very dense nodal grid, and it's not designed to do that. And in order to use this new feature, we can first, of course, we need to enable all the buckling, and this is enabled in the uh, problem specification component. Then this new option can be enabled in the, uh, in the solver option. And of course, this is a preview version, and maybe later we, we, we will change the, uh, the positions and settings, but this is um, showing how we can do it. So here is one very simple example. Again, we have uh, applied loaded with UDL, and you can see the structure has so many long and slender compressive members, which are prone to buckle. So if we enable our new algorithm by adding the uh, all buckling constraint into the problem, and you can see first it will solve the layout position, then it will try to explore local optimals around the optimal point and trying to find the best solution. So once we solve that, the best solution among them will be processed further, like be rationalized and simplified. Then we get a structure which will contain some 
branch-like structures which are better for all our buckling. Next is the uh, global stability. So global stability is basically an eigenvalue optimization problem. So we need to solve a semi-definite programming problem. And unfortunately, this problem is very, very expensive to solve and much more expensive than the linear programming. And at the moment, we haven't got the, uh, we haven't implemented geometry optimization in the SDP problem, although the relevant research has already been done and published. So we might include this in a future version. And because of this limitation, this step is actually a final step, which means the solution after the SDP problem will not be processed further in Paragon, which means the solution cannot be simplified or rationalized further. And because of this, we actually designed two use scenarios. So first, you can incorporate global stability in layout optimization, and this will lead to a um, convex optimization problem. Again, we will identify the global optimal, and it is very expensive to solve. So it is recommended that we only use this um, approach for problems where the structural layouts are likely to be determined primarily by global stability. However, as far as I know, most of the common structures in real life are not primarily determined by global stability. Instead, we can actually solve this problem in a post-processing step. So this will stabilize the structure by adding bracing members and also changing the areas of the, all the members until the structure is stable. And of course, this will be less expensive to solve. So once you stabilize the structure, you can actually check the volume increase. If the volume increase is not significant, that means global stability is not dominating the design, so you can safely uh, rely on the results. So here I would like to show a very, very, very simple example of how global stability works. So here we got um, four pull nodes and four supports, and all the loads are actually in line with the supports. So if you solve it with the current version of the program, you get two panel structures and you get what to ask for. And of course, the problem is not stable. So then we can process this using this new stabilized component. It will actually add members to stabilize the structure until the, uh, the target load factor is satisfied. So you can see the outcome structure will include some bracing members. And this is, of course, a very simple example shows how global stability works. And as a human designer, we know that if we got two planar structures, we know that it's very easy for us to manually add the bracing members. So it doesn't actually show the strengths of the, uh, this, this new component. However, this is not always um, easy. So in pace, our design problem is relatively complicated with a um, complex design domain. And if the loading locations are less common, and the structures might be quite complex and unusual. And in this case, it's quite hard for a human to find what are the uh, key members to place the structure so it becomes globally stable. So at this time, the, uh, the new stabilized component becomes quite handy. So we'll explore the, uh, the missing members and add them until the target load factor is achieved. And at the same time, the uh, cross areas cross-section areas of the members will also be optimized. So you can see the, uh, the solution is, again, it adds some missing members, although it does not change the structural layout like, uh, largely. So it shows the, um, the power of the, uh, the new stabilized tool. So next topic is the, um, the grillage optimization. As Matthew mentioned earlier, we do make some assumptions of the, uh, the grillage design. So first we fix the depths of the grillage, and then we the design variable would be the, the width of the flange, and the, and the stress limit is on the uh, normal stress in the flanges, and web is not considered in our optimization. And with all the assumptions, we can again formulate a linear programming problem, which means the global optimal is again guaranteed. So in order to solve the, uh, the grillage optimization problem, we only need to specify a grillage domain. And this can be done very easily using our new component UI, which you can set your domain type and it will dynamically change the inputs suitable for your problem. And the workflow is quite similar to Charles' optimization, or almost identical to it. 
The only thing different is now you need to say this is a college domain. And when you enable the solver, you are almost instantly get a solution because it's again a very, very efficient optimization problem to solve. So we get a solution very rapidly. Once we have the, um, the glitch position, as I mentioned, we can actually do a bit more by combining different optimization problems together. So here I'm showing the holistic building optimization. So you can use chance optimization to design an optimal pricing system and use glitch optimization for the floor designs. And these two optimization processes are fully coupled, which means that the optimal structures will be designed simultaneously. So for building structures, we do need to think about how we can create a building layout for the, uh, the problem. So here I'm showing a very simple idea. First, we use polygon to create floor plans. Then you can very quickly add the floors for the glitch optimization. And you can add all the side faces for the racing designs. And of course, we can add columns when needed. Then we can create this uh, design problem, which, um, which actually resembles a uh, a building and uh, in this case i'm showing a very, very simple example and and um, as i mentioned earlier you can uh, you can actually uh, set the, uh, the, the the geometry data in the floor plans like including the shape and the floor levels and floor height i also put the, the column locations and all this data will be processed automatically to generate all the surfaces for the problem and then you need to specify the grillage domains and the trans domains and of course, we need to specify the wind and rollout cases. And then in this problem, we have five low cases. So it will take a bit of time to solve around like uh, 10 to 15 seconds or so. In layout, it does seem to be quite long. However, I don't think it is a, a much big deal because now we have five low cases with a building structure. Just need to wait a bit. <laughs> and all the recordings are in real time. so. See. Yeah, and it takes a while to actually visualize the solution, quite strange. Yeah, then, then if you, well, after we solve the problem, you can examine the, the, the design and you can see the bracing members and the, uh, the grid layouts are optimized. And of course, this, this is a very, very simple case. And you can actually, because Grasshopper is very, very flexible and you can create very, um, like creative floor plans and building layouts, and hopefully you can get some less common designs. So of course, uh, we have many other methods to create the building domains. And here I'm showing another example. Basically, you can create an outline and create a, a tube for the, for, for the building, and then you can slice the, uh, the building and you create all the, the floor grillages. And uh, of course, you can add the columns and you can, and at the moment, the Paragon can solve the problem very uh, efficiently. And in the in the near future, I think we need to, um, well, we plan to actually incorporate some of the common workflows and create some easy to use components for grasshopper beginners. So you don't need to worry about how you can create a building structure. You only need to specify some parameters, then it will create it automatically for you. So we do have some long-term plans because in building design optimization, there will be loads of practical considerations and we'll pick the most important ones and hopefully incorporate it in Paragon and allow us to do more practical designs. Uh, that's all in my talk. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Slim Wei. Um, we've got a few minutes um, for questions. So if you have any questions, please use the, uh, the question box in um, go to webinar. Um, I'm just opening up the uh, the dialogue now. The first question is, um, when is the new release due? Which is always a <laughs> um, the, the million dollar question. Uh, we're hoping that's going to be uh, available ahead of the um, the forthcoming um, hands-on event. So actually, I've got it on screen there on the 10th of um, September. So we're hoping that it's going to be available. Um, in time for that. It might be that um, depending on the amount of time um, it takes to, to do the fine tuning and, and testing, it might be that uh, if you sign up for that event, you get a preview version as opposed to a final public version. So we'll, we'll have to see. Um, but it's, it, it's, in, it's in the autumn time, um, late summer, um, early autumn is when we, we plan to release the software. 
Um, a couple of, of of questions about the sort of history um, of the of the the plugin. Um, when did you start to develop this tool? How much time did you spend to develop this tool? Uh, so <laughs> how, how long's a piece of string? Um, I mean, the, the 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 software is actually built on um, something called Limit State Form, um, which is um, developed by a, a spin-out company from the University of Sheffield, and then that was um, enhanced um, and and made more useful for building design problems during a three-year UK government funded project. Um, and then in the last year, we've been um, doing, doing more work on that. So, so some years is the, is the answer. Um, the question, Peregrine runs on Rhino 5. Um, I don't think we're supporting Rhino 5. Um, I think it has, it has run on Rhino 5, I, 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 the current version um, probably I, I, doesn't. It's yeah, it's not compatible with 105, unfortunately. Yeah, um, things are changing um, rapidly. So it's 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 um, in terms of um, of of developer effort, we would rather spend the time on on developing new features than on on maintaining backward compatibility with old versions of of Rhino, for example. So it, it's it's unlikely to to be coming <laughs> in the future either. Um, is it meant to remain free or will you require yearly subscription licenses? So um, good question. Um, we have tried to make the software free um, at the present time. However, um, Limit State is a is a company and has put in quite a lot of effort into de into developing um, Peregrine, supporting it, and at some stage um, we uh, will need to charge for commercial users. The plan is that for academic users it remains free of charge. Um, Limit State, the company, has a number of products available, mostly for analysis rather than design, and all those products are free for academic use. Um, it seems you optimize either EI for beams or EA for a truss. Can you combine both? Um, it's a good question. In a sense, um, in the formulation there, they, they are, um, but it's, it's kind of hidden. Do you want to say anything about that, Limway? Yeah, yeah, it's actually an intermediate stage because we know the beams are less efficient. So once we have a, a beam structure, then we actually do the geometry optimization. And when the nodes are moved to sometimes in, in optimal locations, then you convert it to a truss again. So it's, that step is sort of hidden. Yeah, um, it, 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 it may be um, exposed more in the future, I guess, um, than we? Yeah, 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 maybe. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> okay, I think we're we're running out of time. I'll see if I can pick up um, a, a last question or so. Um, to what extent do you think optimization can be helpful in applying the strut and time effort in concrete structures? Um, it has been used um, by a number of um, workers for, for a number of years um, for concrete structures. You can go to layopt.com and, and put in dimensions. What it doesn't do at the moment, and there's no immediate plans to, is, is take account of the particular practical issues associated with, with RC. So it's more a sort of a qualitative um, human aid rather than an automated method for that particular purpose. Okay, um, I've got some more questions. I'll try and pick those up um, by email after the event, but we've, we've run out of time, I'm afraid. So thanks very much, uh, everyone, for joining us. Um, final reminder also that of the, the hands-on events that are coming in, in July and September, so there is still time to, to, to sign up for those. Um, so thank you very much, and um, I'll see hopefully many of you uh, in a week's time. Thank you, and goodbye. Bye.